jibba jab. Bamboozle new canoes all pippity pop she called. You jibba jab. Bamboozle new canoes all pippity pop she called. I mean, you keep on talking, but you don't know where to turn it off. Welcome to the weekend. I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute. You're watching Independent Thinking. We spend a lot of time on this program and, well, most current affairs shows talking about two branches of government. We talk a lot about the executive branch, Bill Ritter here, and we talk a lot about the legislative branch. In Washington, we do pretty much the same thing, but there's another branch of government that doesn't get a whole lot of attention to change that. A good friend of mine from the Institute of Justice, Chip Miller, thank you for joining us. John, it's great to be here. Thanks All for having me. The, the plug I usually do. What I love about the Institute for Justice is you guys are public uh, public interest law firm but you're a public interest law firm on on I don't want to say the right side but on the free market side that's right we believe that government should get out of the way and let people get on with their business in pursuit of happiness and in starting businesses um, owning private property educating their kids and speaking freely and all too often government stands in the way of that and for instance you take on interesting clients such as me every now and then as as a client you're helping the independence institute bring a suit against the state of colorado for their campaign finance laws saying that it's a uh, it's unconstitutional to tell small organizations they can't have a say when when elections are going on that's exactly right the independence institute has done a great job here in so many ways but one of them was in standing up against this nonsense that was on the ballot not long ago and in doing so doing a very heroic job but finding suddenly that you ran afoul of those campaign finance laws that not only here but across the nation are too often used to suppress free speech actually not we, to we weren't run, we were foul in fact the judge said we were completely clean well, it only took us it only took us eighty thousand dollars worth of court costs and all sorts of other aggravation and then three days after the election on a referendum exactly. C, we get the clean bill of health of course you guys didn't uh, uh, fail any any laws here but the point being if we were a smaller organization if we were another c3 organization and we didn't have the chutzpah yep. to, to fight it it would be very tempting to just say, no, I, I, I'm not going to weigh in on this because we might get into trouble. That's exactly right. And all too often, that's exactly what, how campaign finance laws are used, is to intimidate and browbeat uh, opposition into silence. All right. Let, let's talk a little bit about the courts, because apparently you're one of the lawyer types. And so explain it to me. you got a new book out, which is, I think, a terrific book, uh, The Dirty Dozen. I love the movie. <laughs> love the, the scene when Trini Lopez is running down with the bullets. Great stuff. Congratulations on it. Dirty Dozen is what? The Dirty Dozen is a book that my colleague Bob Levy and I wrote, which looks at the 12 worst Supreme Court cases since the New Deal. And we call them the worst court cases because they had a truly radical impact on America. They effectively amended the Constitution and led to a dramatic and, and radical increase in the size of government and a terrific loss of liberty. What I like about the 12 stories is that they're, they're very human in that it's not just a, a legal brief that nobody can understand except you guys. It's a story of people who are just trying to do, go about their business of life and somehow government said you can't do it and the Supreme Court said, you know what, you, you can't do what you want to do. That's exactly right. A lot of times these cases, because they're old going back to the New Deal or they involve uh, small folks who are out just doing their own, uh, their own thing, people overlook just how radical the cases actually were. Take, for instance, a case that vastly expanded the ability of the federal government to regulate every economic activity in this country. That involved a farmer in the Midwest. This is, this is one of my favorite ones. All right, let, let, let me set this up. I've always wondered, I've, I've read the Constitution, and the Congress has enumerated rights. It says you can do this, enumerated you powers. can do Enumerated powers, excuse me. You can do this, you can do that, you can do this. If it's not listed here, you can't do it. You can print money, you can make roads, you can do the post office, you can declare war, and you can also regulate interstate commerce. But if it's not in all this stuff, you can't do it. But yet I'm seeing them pass laws telling, telling people what they can do inside their own state, which I would think would be unconstitutional. Tell me this story again, because I, I always find this one the best. Well, up until the New Deal, the Interstate Commerce Clause gave Congress the power to regulate commerce between the states, to basically stop states from creating barriers or protectionist uh, uh, laws to favor their in-state industries from out-of-state industries. In, in other words, so if, if, if one state wanted to have a tariff on stuff coming in from another state, it really couldn't do it. The feds could step in and go, no, no. sorry, you can't do that. We're free one trade. country. We're going to free trade because it was a time when states were much more powerful than the feds. That's right. That certainly switched around. So Congress had the power to, to regulate commerce, to make sure it was fair across That's the board. That's right. And right. Fair enough. That worked just fine for 150 years, but then comes the New Deal, and here is um, uh, poor Mr. Wickard out in 
of the Midwest raising corn for his family, wheat for his family, and deciding that he's going to grow his own wheat, he's going to feed it to his livestock, use it on his uh, property, and maybe, and sell a little bit of it in, in state, just locally there. What state was this? This was um, Iowa. Iowa. So this, this is just a farmer yeah, just growing a farmer. wheat on his for own his land. own use. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah, completely in state. Well, it happened that the federal government had passed a law that limited the amount of wheat that could be grown on anyone's property because they were trying to set basically price support for wheat and make sure there wasn't a surplus of wheat. Well, Mr. Filburn, or Mr. Rickard, actually exceeded the amount of wheat that he was allowed to grow on his acreage. So the feds, not even, the, not even his own home state legislature, not even his own city or county, but the feds said, Mr. Rickard, you can only grow so much wheat on That's your right. own property. And for every bushel of wheat over this amount, you're fined a certain amount of money. And he exceeded it by, you know, a few dozen bushels. But this, this was wheat for his own animals, That's right? right? He was going to bake his own That's bread right. with it. He would, so it wasn't, it wasn't a sell. He wasn't going to send it across state lines. Completely within the state. And the federal government comes in and says, wait a minute, you violated this law that we passed, which regulates wheat nationwide for the purpose of making sure that we determine the proper amount of wheat that's going to be available at the proper price. And he said, wait a minute, this is completely inside my state. There's no interstate commerce involved at all. The court said, you're wrong. Because you used it for your own benefit and your own purposes, that meant that you weren't going to be buying wheat from someone else who did use interstate commerce. That's an indirect but sufficient connection with interstate commerce to give the federal government the carte blanche to regulate. Because the federal government knows enough about supply and demand to know that if I grow a little bit more wheat, that, that's wheat that somebody else could have grown and sold to me, maybe across state lines. Maybe. Therefore. And over the years, since FDR's day when this, when this happened, how has that law been perverted? How has that ruling been that, perverted? That, that, law, that, that ruling has basically made it possible for the federal government to regulate any economic activity in this country, no matter how local. Recently, um, the Supreme Court and uh, Clarence Thomas in dissent observed that there's truly no activity so local that it can uh, be free from federal regulation. Quilting bees, backyard bake sales, garage sales, those literally could be regulated by the federal government if it chooses to. By this to. one decision. By that by one decision. By this one simple decision they saying the Commerce Clause can be anything that anybody makes or does now we have kings in Washington, D.C., when in fact we had some parity with the states. That's exactly right. Well, if, and if you've wondered in the midst of this bailout discussion how Congress gets the authority to basically redistribute wealth as wildly as it's doing now, if you wonder how the Treasury Department has virtually unchecked authority to implement the TARP program, if you wonder how the, the uh, Congress can void contracts the way it has in the mortgage industry, well, all you have to do is look back at Supreme Court cases that we described that gave Congress and the executive branch that authority. Give me, give me another one. Give me another one of your favorite from the Dirty Dozen. Well, let's talk about the, the redistribution of wealth since that's such a big thing these days. You know, it started in 1936 when the, uh, the federal government passed, the Congress passed the Social Security Act. It was challenged. The court looked at it. And in looking at it, it looked at the general welfare provision of the Constitution. Prior to that, that had never been a, a source of massive federal authority. Where, where is that? Is that the preamble? No, no, that's actually in the Constitution. Where in the, the Constitution? Oh, I'd have to, Article 8, is it? I, I, I can't, it's no, Article 3, Article All right, 3. so it's not, we're not talking about promote the general welfare. No, 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 this, this, is, is, this, this is actually a substantive provision of the Constitution, and it had never been applied in a way that would grant unilateral authority to the government to when, redistribute When the wealth. framers put together promote general welfare or put in the general mm -hmm. welfare clause, what did they mean?